Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. We're live on Spice FM. We're live on KTN Home. We are also live online. We live stream the show on Spice FM KE, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. TJ Apache is watching us from Goa in India. There are people who watch us from New Zealand. Others who watch us from Australia. And one of those who have been watching us from Australia, hopefully, is in the studio with us this morning. <laughs> he is Dr. Robert Floyd, Secretary General of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Dr. Floyd, welcome to the studio. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. It's good to have you. First, I think we'll have a lot of conversations about when you hear nuclear test ban and then the man in charge of nuclear test ban treaty is in Kenya. And recently we were talking about uh, in the papers whether our nuclear agency is up and running. And then you see the man in charge of test ban is in the Kenya. You start wondering, okay, what's happening? And we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's going on? <laughs> what's been going on? Let's start by understanding what CBTO is all about. What's a Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization? It was uh, on the 1st of August this year that I took over as the head of this UN-related agency, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. And it's responsible for implementing and working towards the entry into force of the CTBT, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Put simply, this treaty is about a global ban against the testing of nuclear weapons, you know, that any nuclear explosion should not take place anywhere, anytime. Mm. And my job and my organization's job is to set up a monitoring system so that we can give assurance to the whole world that we will know if anybody is testing anywhere at any time. And even now, and in the test stage of setting up this, this over 300 stations around the world, mm. you know, we see it works. All right. So when, how old is the treaty and how many countries have ratified it? The treaty was open for signature on the 24th of September, 25 years ago, 1996. So we've just had our 25th anniversary. Mm. In fact, this is our 25th anniversary year, and we're looking at seeing as many countries as possible that would join the treaty in this time. Mm -hmm. But you ask how many already? 185 out of 196 countries have signed the treaty. Mm. 170 countries have ratified it, you know, have done the legal work, you know, to commit themselves to it. Mm. So it's nearly universally supported. Sure. Who are the eight that haven't signed? <laughs> The eight you refer to is a particular list in Annex 2 of the treaty where every country, some 40-something countries in that list, every country in that list has to ratify before the treaty can enter into force. And there are eight of those that have not yet ratified. There are 18 other countries that are not in that list that have mm. not yet ratified. Mm. And so part of my job is to work you know, with those countries to see them uh, you know, join. What is this treaty all about? So the treaty, the treaty was even way back to 1945 when the first nuclear weapons were used in the, the context of, of conflict in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The leaders of the world even then, they determined that we need a world without nuclear weapons. And one way to get a world without nuclear weapons is to be able to have a ban in place against testing. Because if you cannot test a weapon, you can't develop a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. And that is why it is so important. And then we can, with the technology we have available today, we can actually monitor for vibrations, for sound, for, for vibrations in the ocean. Yeah, we can tell whether there's been a nuclear explosion conducted mm -hmm. anywhere. Mm. So we're not talking about, uh, because of the fact that we're asking uh, the, the, the the organization is asking countries around the world to be part of this agreement, essentially. We're not talking about legality. We're not talking about prosecutorial action. We're not talking about anything like that. We're talking about an understanding from country to country. Am I right? Yeah, we, we are talking about that, but we are talking about a little more than that mm -hmm. as well, is that the legal process a country goes through when it ratifies this treaty is it is legally binding itself to not test. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it is putting that into its domestic law as well as then joining into the international law when okay. the treaty enters into force. But it, it's not a treaty which has a huge amount 
of overhead attached to it mm. for a state. If you think about a state like Kenya, um, it's so easy for your government to say, yes, we commit to this treaty. And they made that commitment many years ago mm. because they know they're not going to test a nuclear weapon, that they're not going to have a nuclear weapon program. This is easy to agree. And in fact, every country in the world mm. says that this ban on nuclear weapons testing yeah. is a good idea. Right. This is not that we have some saying, oh, this is a bad idea, some saying it's a good idea. The problem with the eight that you mentioned is their strategic circumstances don't make it so easy for them to want to make that legally binding decision just now. Mm. But at some point... They will. I, I trust so, I hope so, and I'll certainly be working to that end. Yeah. What's the difference then between the, non, the test ban treaty and the nuclear non-proliferation treaty? The nuclear non-proliferation treaty um, is a broader, grander deal about nuclear issues, and it's got what we often refer to as, as three pillars to it. One pillar is about um, disarmament, and so a commitment for those that have nuclear weapons to get rid of them. Another pillar is about non-proliferation, which means don't spread nuclear weapons technology to others or, or develop it yourself. Mm -hmm. And the third pillar, and a really important one, is that even with these two pillars of disarmament, non-proliferation, every country should have the right and the access to nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. Okay. Whether it is for radio pharmaceuticals, for treating cancer or di you know, diagnosis, etc., you know, countries should not be left out from that. Mm. So that is a really broad treaty, but it is the cornerstone of the nuclear architecture and the international arrangements. Okay. The treaty I have got responsibility for assists the NPT, as we call it, in the, the disarmament and the non-proliferation area. Mm. What would you say to those who may think, you know, just sitting back and hearing, okay, so we have a, a test ban treaty and all, and it's, not, it's talking about banning of testing, but it's not really pushing and advocating for disarmament of nuclear weapons. So this is controlling and saying, these countries have weapons already and they don't need to test. They already know that they are, what they have is working, but they do not want anybody else to develop a nuclear weapon. Yeah, you're touching on one of the tension points, you know, amongst states. Mm. And, and it really, the context is back in the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that we just discussed, because everybody thought these three pillars should all be implemented at, a, at the same rate. Mm -hmm. But the disarmament commitments are moving quite slowly and certainly way slower than many states would like. Mm. And so that brings some tension and discontent with other states that feel they're upholding their end by not developing a nuclear weapons capability uh, and allowing the IAEA, a sister organization to the one that I head up, mm. to be able to put in place safeguards. You know, that's an inspection system and a confidence building system to, to be able to be sure that somebody is not developing nuclear weapons. So that, that does bring that tension mm. between those with or without weapons. But what I hear, the heartbeat I hear in Africa is that, you know, there's a different treaty, another one called the Treaty of Palandaba. Mm. This followed on from the time when South Africa chose to dismantle their nuclear weapons capability mm. and to put that behind them. A courageous and a bold step, one I'm just so proud of the country of South Africa for doing, because they have shown the world that you can walk away from having a nuclear weapons capability. And survive. And survive, but even, even it is good for your country mm. Mm. in so many ways. But the continent of Africa then have joined together with the Treaty of Palandaba saying, we want a nuclear weapons free zone in the continent of Africa. So I applaud them. I was recently at their fifth meeting of their states' parties, and I had the, the honor to address the, the opening of that just last week in, mm. in Johannesburg. And I applaud the African continent for standing on this principle and to aspiring to a nuclear-free Africa and so providing leadership and contributing to a nuclear-free world.
Can we break it down a little bit? I mean, for bite sizes and to say, all right, fine. Well, we mean we, we say um, encouraging more and more countries uh, around the world to not test, uh, not in some cases, you know, get rid of your capabilities completely. What are the dangers of having these properties in countries? The dangers of having nuclear weapons in countries, as, as some have said, and I think there's, there's real wisdom to this, for as long as nuclear weapons exist, then there is the risk they will be used. Mm -hmm. And so safety doesn't really come until these weapons have been dismantled and destroyed and taken out mm -hmm. of, of the defense posture of any country. Right. It, it's not a necessarily a stable place mm. where we sit with capabilities you know, in and around the world. Right. It is encouraging that in conflict, nuclear weapons have not been used since 1945. Mm -hmm. uh, that's encouraging. But it'd be way more encouraging to know that the arsenals that we don't had been dismantled mm -hmm. and weren't even an option, you know, in the context of, of conflict. You know, when nuclear is mentioned, the, the next word that pops into one's mind is bomb. Mm. But then there's nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. So how then do you explain to a layperson yeah. the fundamental differences between these and the known benefits of nuclear energy and the possible disadvantages that they also that yeah. also comes with it. That is a a very good observation is that for some people you mention nuclear, the link immediately is bomb. And yet, you know, I myself am a beneficiary of peaceful nuclear energy in that I've had radio pharmaceuticals used to, you know, for, for tracing in my own body. Mm. And I must say that when I was subject to that, I was so glad that nuclear technology has developed in a way which is actually beneficial for all of humanity. Whilst at the same time, we've got other applications of nuclear technology, which could be devastating for the whole of humanity. And that's part of the responsibility that I feel and others in the international community is to try and remove that risk whilst not limiting and restricting the peaceful uses. Because uh, the other one you alluded to is, is the production of electricity mm. you know, from nuclear base. And, and this is being looked at really seriously in this current age where we're concerned about reducing carbon emissions. Yeah. And nuclear energy provides an option which is a lower carbon emitting you know, way. And, and I know the government of Kenya are looking at these things. Yeah. I must say, back to your introductory comments, there is no connection between Kenya's interest in nuclear uh, electricity generation and my visit to this country. Mm. No connection whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> let me be very clear. <laughs> if we go back to these countries, uh, looking at this treaty, wouldn't it be more significant or impactful from where you sit if the specific countries on the planet today who are testing and who own these capabilities were to walk away from them and actually become part of this? Wouldn't it be more significant uh, in terms of the work that you do? Uh, and that you're involved in right now, if those who have tested, if those who've been involved, if those who are still suffering, I mean, uh, the, 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 the historic stories of um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we will never forget, right? Yeah. But wouldn't it be that you would be able to take a thousand steps forward in this if those who actually own these capabilities are signing up for this? Well, I've got some good news for you. Mm some of those countries have signed up and have ratified the treaty and have done that quite a lot of years ago. Mm. It, it is not that it's the eight that we're still encouraging to ratify so the treaty can enter in force are all of those that possess nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't. For the benefit of um, our listeners, who are some of those that have signed and who are these eight yeah. that haven't? Right, <laughs> the eight I refer to. <laughs> uh, let me give you... The positive side, the ones that, that are possessors of nuclear weapons that have uh, ratified the treaty, um, France, the United Kingdom, the Russian Federation, 
So they're three of the P5, mm. the permanent members of the Security Council, mm. that have ratified this treaty. Mm. You know, two others of the P5 have not yet done so. That's the United States of America and China. Mm. But the others of the eight, let me list them. Um, so uh, whilst we're in China's part of the world, North Korea. Mm. Uh, so they've neither signed nor ratified. Yep. Then in South Asia, India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And then as we move over then towards the Middle East and North Africa, mm. then we have Iran, Israel and Egypt. So you can see those countries have got their own particular context and calculus as to timing and... and Who does what, when, before the other. E exactly, my <laughs> friend. Um, yeah, and these are serious issues. And so as I've taken this role on, mm. my approach to the eight countries in NX2 that are yet to ratify is that I want to sit down with each of them mm. individually. And for the five of the eight that have already signed the treaty, I want to understand why they signed it. And for many of them, it was many years ago. Mm. I want to understand for all of them, their current thoughts and relationship to the treaty. And I want to explore with each of them, with all eight of them, mm -hmm. what are the pathways forward from where we are now to where we all want to be. I have a sense them. that uh, a lot of the conversations will actually be political conversations, not necessarily with regards to whether they, is, they understand the need to sign the treaty or to ratify the treaty. It will, a lot of it will just be on political and existential issues that they're dealing with. Our neighbor, our arch foe, is our arch foe. Are you also having a conversation? If you come to Israel, they'll ask you, have you had a conversation with Iran? Or have you not yet? If you go to Pakistan... Did you talk to India or, or have you not yet? So as you're having these conversations, are you then prepared to play the politics of that game? I, uh, I'm a scientist by training. Um, in fact, my first research project as a scientist was cattle tick control in Eastern Central Africa, <laughs> which included coming to Kenya yeah. right. uh, back in the 80s. And it was such a pleasure to you know, to imbibe a bit of Africa, you know, way back then. Um, but my career has moved from being a practicing research scientist for half of my career to move into policy and even political support. I was working in the, the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet in Australia, working on security policy and advising the Prime Minister of Australia for seven years. And then I've moved into the diplomatic world uh, as well to do with treaties and controls around weapons of mass destruction. Mm. The, you're rightly identifying that a conversation with any one of the countries in the eight is not about is the CTBT a good idea mm. because they actually declare that. I addressed the UN Security Council on the 27th of September, you know, just last month, and the countries on the Security Council, which is the permanent five plus others, including Kenya, by the way, at chair. the moment, uh, chair this Very month, nice. absolutely. Congratulations, Kenya. Mm. Um, every one of them spoke in support of the CTBT. So that's not where the conversation has to start. Mm. Um, where the conversation needs to be, I think, and this is where I think those countries would take the conversation, is their current uh, strategic you know, geopolitical situation mm. and as to whether the circumstances are permissive for them to be able to move forward. Mm. It's a similar conversation about disarmament, uh, but this is specifically just about a commitment to testing. To, to mm. Testing. Mm. This is Kenya's biggest conversation. It's the Situation Room on Spice FM, online and on KTN Home, having a conversation around the role of Africa in keeping the world safe from nuclear testing. From the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, the Executive Secretary, Dr. Robert Floyd, is with us in the hot seat. And he took office on the 1st of August, 2021. This is his first main trip and he's decided to come to Africa. So tell us about that. Why you decided to come to Africa and what is it that you hope to achieve in Africa? What have you observed in Africa so far? It was my priority when uh, taking up office as my first trip that I could choose uh, that I would want to come to Africa. 
and I had a few other uh, commitments I couldn't choose that I had to go to, but, uh, but Africa I chose, and uh, it's been such an honor and a privilege to be here. Why Africa? Well, because of the deep commitment of Africa to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, because of the significance of Africa, over 10% of our monitoring stations in our global network are actually established here in Africa. Mm -hmm. And so that technology needs to be serviced and maintained by the various countries in Africa. Building capability in Africa is incredibly important mm. so that every country in Africa has got the ability to run these stations, to work with the data, to analyze the data, and to understand for themselves if anybody is tested. But in addition, that they can use this data for other peaceful and scientific purposes whether it is earthquake and seismic monitoring or mm. tsunami warning or even aspects of climate change research. Mm -hmm. So reaching out to Africa um, to me was really important and I'm so glad I'm here. It's interesting you say that because, again, once you hear anything nuclear testing or such, the negative um, is what is always in the front of the mind. So what we're saying essentially is that for the continent, for countries on the continent, that there are many things you can actually do. And are we seeing that there's encouragement uh, from the commission uh, for that? Absolutely. We, we, uh, we don't do broad training in various areas of uh, peaceful uses of nuclear technology, such as medical you know, work or nuclear power plants, etc. But we do, for the implementation of our treaty, we do do capability development of people like seismologists, um, you know, geologists, physicists, etc. You know, opportunity for skill enhancement and particular capability development. And I, I must say, Kenya is doing a brilliant job in cooperation with us. Mm. If I can tell you just a little story, mm -hmm. on the weekend, I went and visited the two monitoring stations that Kenya ha runs, mm -hmm. you know, as a part of our global network. And it was just so heartening to see a professor who is approaching retirement, who's worked with us and has been involved in technical cooperation and training courses and assisting in all sorts of ways for many years. Then some mid-career, uh, uh, a lady and a gentleman who were very expert in their science and their craft. And then there was a young lady mm -hmm who's recently graduated from her master's degree. Mm -hmm. And she was just so keen and so good. She's a geologist by background. Um, and I could see almost three generations. And as they interacted with their other staff that were there as well, there was this openness to be sharing what they'd learned mm -hmm. and encouraging and supporting. They were not holding their knowledge to themselves mm -hmm. because that was what made them significant. But they were open-hearted and sharing with these others. And the picture of greater and greater gender balance. And to me, it's a, a picture which will stay in my mind forever as I see intergenerational commitment because this cause we cannot deal with in one generation. Mm. We're going to have to keep going you know, forever on this. What you saw clearly fascinated you. Is it something that you haven't seen in other places that you visited? Well, this was actually, Kenya was the first location since I've taken up office where I have visited any of the monitoring stations. Um, but, but I know in some other places, it's not quite the same. Mm. You often have people with some seniority and great knowledge, but you might not have a generation or two moving in behind them. So I can't say for sure mm. how common it is. But I was very, very impacted by it. Mm. You know, it was the, the picture of diversity and intergenerational engagement in a cause so significant for mm. the good of humanity. I keep thinking about my own grandchildren. Mm. My grandchildren motivate me in what I do in this job because I want to leave a better world for them. Mm. You know, that's what motivates me. If there is some little bit that I can contribute which leaves a safer, better world for my grandchildren, your grandchildren, then that's the, that's the job I want to have. And I'm so honored to actually have such a job. Mm. You've talked about the two stations in Kenya. Tell us about the work that they do, these two stations, and, yeah. and how then that relates to the global, in the global context. In the forests on the outskirts of Kenya, mm. 
is one of the stations. And this is high technology, amazing stuff. And what that station does is it listens for vibrations in the atmosphere, you know, of a particular frequency. Mm -hmm. And it's called an infrasound station. There are a number of these in our network scattered all around the world. And it is this network of stations which allows us to know if there has been any sort of explosion in the atmosphere anywhere that could be characterized as potentially nuclear. What's our range? Well, global, because that's a, it's a network of, of infrasound stations mm -hmm. and we can pick up uh, a meteorite entering the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so we will get that tracked and we, we know where that's um, even when uh, Jeff Bezos goes into space. Yeah, you can tell. Then that can be picked up by some of the stations closer by. Uh, so it's in incredibly. So then you must pick out a lot of a lot of um, you know things that are happening. So a rocket being shot into space, satellite being launched into space, all these things that are picked up by these stations. So how are you able to distinguish and tell this is Kim Kim Jong Un testing something, and oh, this is just us through. Yeah, this is part of the technology and the scientific uh, work that's going on and has gone on is that you have all of this data because we've got three or four different streams of data. We've got seismic data, so picking up vibrations in the Earth's crust. We've got the infrasound, which is vibrations and noise in the atmosphere. And then these hydroacoustic stations, which pick up similar you know, vibrations in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's picking up a radiological you know, material in the atmosphere, you know, different stream. So one thing is you can collect all of this data from stations, you know, over 300 stations around the world. Mm -hmm. The second is what does it mean? And can you tell from that data the signature of something which could be a nuclear explosion? That is where the really smart people in my organization and other uh, organizations around the world keep working to refine that analytical capability. Mm. But I, I can tell you it works, not the infrasound so much, but the seismic. In my previous job when I was in Australia, mm. I was in my office one morning, I get a phone call and it's from Geosciences Australia. They're the people who actually analyze and monitor you know, seismic vibrations as a part of the CTBTO's network of, of um, you know, cooperating agents. Mm. And I get a phone call and they say, just giving you heads up, we think that only a matter of a few minutes before, five minutes or so before, uh, there is a suspicious activity in North Korea that we think could be a nuclear test. Mm -hmm. And it was eerie. <laughs> I went on to Twitter and nobody knew, <laughs> nobody knew. Uh -huh. And then over, you know, coming minutes, then this started to come out. So but within a small number of minutes, you the smart tell. people knew this does not look like a natural event mm. of an earthquake or, or a f fall of rocks, you know, within the tunnels and things in mm. North Korea. We, mm. we will even pick that up these days. Um, but they, they knew from the signature that it did not look natural hmm. and what they alerted do me. With that? What do you then do with that information? See this thing, because you have it, you're aware that somebody, you know, would likely be doing something, but then somebody who's not part of the treaty or is not bound by any kind of ratification, what does that then allow you to do as concerns yeah. said country or future behavior? Okay, so l let's take that kind of example further, is that my national, well, then, my then national um, authority in Australia, mm. you know, they looked at the data, they saw the signal, they were curious that this does not look natural. And every country around the world that has a national data center could have been forming similar conclusions. Mm -hmm. See, the CTBT is so inclusive. Mm. It, it sets a level playing field. We want to then build the capability, back to capability development. We want to build the capability so that people in all countries can work with this data mm -hmm. and work with the reports that come from the CTBTO. So that's the first thing. You know, each country has got the data and so like, mm, curious. Mm -hmm. Back at headquarters in Vienna, we have the International Data Center, which has got a very large aggregation of people that are very smart on this stuff and they would immediately have been onto it and started to analyze and develop products which would then be shared with states about it. 
The job of the CTBTO at the moment, because the treaty hasn't entered into force, is about developing the ability to verify, to, sure. to, to monitor mm. and share that with countries. So then what happens after that if there is a conclusion formed that this looks like a non-natural event and potentially a nuclear event? In the case of North Korea, it's, it's easy because they actually tell us. <laughs> they test, or we tested. Yeah. That that's part of you know, their process. Mm. Um, but what happens then? Mm. Is that regardless of where we are with the treaty and it's entering into force, those become topics that will almost certainly end up before the UN Security Council. Mm. So that's where it goes. How then. different would it be if the treaty were to come into force? Oh, I long for that day where the treaty would be in force mm. because then it actually allows us to use the full set of capabilities mm. in a real uh, purpose of verification. You know, you can verify something when it is legally committed and bound. Mm. Um, and there are other capabilities, not just monitoring, but the, the on-site inspection capability, which is a follow-up activity to be able to then, you know, inspect on the ground, mm. you know, what, what has happened. Because maybe somebody denies that it was a nuclear explosion. And so then you want to go and then do some other uh, monitoring and investigation on the ground. Mm. That would be possible after entry into force. Um, so... It also then brings uh, a bunch of other arrangements around the treaty and around my organization into play, where at the moment we're setting up the capability, mm -hmm. and the capability is working but still needs to be further developed, but is not yet at a point where it's legally enacted. So then at present, what is it that your organization is, is doing vis-a-vis -vis what the other organizations, for example, the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, is doing yeah what does what do they do i thought they go to the ground they check whether there's any activity that that's that's correct is the iaea in their area on non-proliferation uh, their safeguards area mm. sets up arrangements with all states so that they can inspect and the states are required to report on all sorts of things to be able to verify that what they are doing with nuclear technology and nuclear material is entirely for peaceful purposes. Mm. So the IAEA has that important role of being the nuclear inspector, as we often hear the language in mm. the international media you know, for the world, to pick up, is there the signs that any state is trying to develop a nuclear weapon capability? Mm. That's not our role. Mm -hmm. Our role is a very specific piece, which is to say, in that pathway, if there was a state that was seeking to develop a nuclear weapon and maybe the IEA hadn't picked that up, but if they're going to test, we will pick it up. And there is something very powerful about the network we've set up because before 1996, when the CTBT was first opened for signature, mm. there had been about 2,000 nuclear explosive tests conducted in the world. 2000. Now, signature, open for signature in 1996, 25 years later, how many tests have there been in that last 25 years? Mm -hmm. And the answer is stunning. Less than a dozen. Mm. Right. Less than a dozen. And if we look at this millennium, only one country has tested. Mm. So what has happened is that we have something like a global norm, but it's actually a, a set of moratoria that right. different countries have committed to in their own political right to say, we will not test. Mm. And I really honor those countries for taking that moratorium step, even though some of them haven't signed the treaty mm. and some of them haven't ratified it. But if they have already produced uh, the weapons, mm -hmm and they tested them even, say, a decade ago. Yeah. Would it then not mean that they understand the science and they can just reproduce more? That, that's correct. So putting a ban on testing yes. means for a country that has nuclear weapons already, yes. they could still develop the same kinds of weapons into the future, yes, and they would not need to test necessarily. 
But if they wanted to develop a whole new class of weapons or an approach, etc., they almost certainly would need to test. So this limits at least where they can go on that. This does not eliminate weapons. No, that's that's a separate you know, requirement you know, under the NPT. Um, People have the means to even uh, manufacture and produce such weapons. Surely, are they also not capable of coming up with ways of testing these weapons to elude your detection? That's... Uh, that's something of the technology race that goes on in many areas of verification for any sort of treaty, mm -hmm. uh, not just ours. Yes. Um, there are approaches, you know, which are called simulation approaches that countries can use, you know, a computer modeling approach to develop ideas. But it's highly unlikely. Mm -hmm that you would ever deploy a new class of weapon that mm. you'd only simulated and not actually tested. Because if you were to deploy a nuclear weapon in the context of battle, you want to be very confident it will work. Yeah. And are you going to be that confident based on simulation? Mm. So it has an effect on further enhancement and development of new, um, you know, mm technologies and approaches to weapons, but it does not actually eliminate the weapons that exist. Yeah. You know, the thing about nuclear energy or nuclear power and nuclear weapons is that it's a source of power. Well, whether you're talking about just energy in the pleasant and delightful sense of the word, or in terms of strategic advantages, I have very little faith in human beings when it comes to national egos and the lengths to which they will actually go to achieve these ends. Now, the question I want to ask is, when one of these many stations you have sense and understand that some test has taken place, what powers do you have? What can you do? Yeah. And what do you do? So at the moment where the treaty has not yet entered into force, mm -hmm. What we do is that we will analyze the information that comes in. We will produce reports which would go out to all of the, the member states of our treaty organization. And so we then empower them to take decisions in their national capacity or in a collective form to bring pressure on a country that may have tested. Mm. Uh, we, we see that with North Korea, mm. is that the evidence of testing is there. There's the uh, statements around testing by uh, North Korea themselves, and it generally ends up in the Security Council. Mm. Mm. So, so that's what happens. But there's not at the moment a, an international law that has been violated. When the treaty enters into force, then there is. Mm. Dr. Floyd, but, I sense a lot of unfairness in the world when it comes to these matters of, of nuclear. You know, on the one hand, they are the big boys who have not just the weapons, but they also have the economic power and the political power and of influence over other parts of the world. And then they want to lord it over everybody else that this is how you shall live and this is how we shall go about things. So part of the reasons why maybe there could have been, you know, fewer tests being conducted in the last decades in the last two and a half decades could also be that there is any sense that you could be developing some nuclear capability of any sort and we don't like it imposition of economic sanctions and everything else that basically cripples you and cripples your capacity to do that and also even taking away your scientists and killing them and and throwing bombs into your country we saw what happened in iraq with a conversation around, you know, development of nuclear and getting nuclear into power. So as, you, you know, a, an organization that is looking at representing the ideals for the whole world, how do you balance between the politics of those who would like to remain the lords of the universe versus those who would like to develop a nuclear weapon, really, because there's, we still we want to develop a nuclear weapon. One of the things I really appreciate about how the CTBT, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, has been formulated is that it creates pretty much a level playing field, is that we do not have within our treaty classes of states 
as in those that possess and are allowed to possess and those that do not possess nuclear weapons. And, and part of the very satisfying part, uh, satisfying aspects of this is building the capability that every state can access the data, mm -hmm. regardless of their size. Mm. Um, it creates that level playing field. And to see that empowerment of all states, because with the data, with the understanding, with the knowledge, comes a more powerful voice. Mm. And that levels the playing field. Mm. Um, so that is a good aspect. Uh, you know, there are many difficult aspects to areas of tension and if a country chooses to go a certain direction, what can you do to seek to change that trajectory? Mm -hmm. But as I said earlier on, I'm so proud of how things were responded to in South Africa, where they chose to then dismantle their nuclear weapons program. Mm. And they can demonstrate to all that that is actually a good and a solid decision that does not affect mm. the forward trajectory of your country. Mm. Um, we see other examples where it's more problematic, uh, but South Africa is a great example great. You know, that that can be done. We thank you very much for um, choosing to come and speak to us about the work that you're doing and getting people to understand the work that the CTBTO is doing. As we conclude, now that you're in Africa and you're looking at what African countries have come together and done, and this is with the African Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Treaty, the Palindaba Treaty, where Africa said Africa is a nuclear free zone. How do you intend to use that to gain the momentum and convince the rest of the world yeah. To go the same route. In this 25th anniversary year of the CTBTO's opening for signature, my goal is to see as many countries ratify this treaty in this next 12 months mm -hmm. as we possibly can. I've courageously set the goal that I want to see at least five countries uh, to ratify. Mm -hmm. There are only 18 outside of the Annex 2 mm -hmm. that are yet to ratify. And I'd love to see five. I can tell you now, the first one of those five is almost certainly going to come from Africa. Mm. You know, is the Gambia have already completed mm. their domestic processes and will lodge their instrument of ratification in New York anytime. And I tell you, we will celebrate when that happens. But there are several other countries mm. in Africa that have not yet ratified. And my goal is to reach out to those countries to work with them to provide assistance and support and to reach out to other countries in the region to assist their brothers and sisters as they move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, one in Latin America and the Latin American countries will rally around and help. Several in the South Pacific, in my original home part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is going to be not a time for shaming, but it's going to be a time for celebration. A time for celebration as we complete whole regions mm. where every country will have ratified. That's well, the most honouring way that we can think about the 25th anniversary and what I'm looking forward to. Positive outlook you have there. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Dr. Robert Floyd is the Executive Secretary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organisation. He took up office just in August. He decided first main trip that we want to do is come to Africa. He's in Kenya. This is the second country in Africa? Second, that's it. Second in Africa, after South Africa. Thank you for coming to us and uh, speaking to us as well. A pleasure. Thank you so much. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.